Sailing for days in the open sea Hunting the blood of my enemies Searching for gold with Gilmecki Where the pirates of the coast Hello everybody, this is Rich and you are watching This Hour which is a pretty awesome show. I'm going to real quick bring on my, my co-host, my buddy, Josh Obi. How you doing, Josh? Hello. I just realized that we are nameless. I'm going to quickly throw on my third, uh, my, my little namey thing so that I don't forget who I am. Yeah, All right, so. I'm getting the little pop-ups, so I don't know what's What? Going there. Oh, no. Well, that's Josh, and I'm by process of elimination. I'm not Josh, because you see Rich. b Sour yeah. is a... Primarily a black sales TV show fan show. Well, we do, right. Yeah, we do it through an awesome lens. What's the lens that we, we use for... Well, we talk about black sales, the best pirate show on television, as if it were a, uh apocalypse world game that happened to also be on television, uh, which which is a pretty useful uh, lens because we get to talk about uh, what how apocalypse worlds does things well and how not to do things and... Uh, it's 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 fun. Yes, it is super fun. And then at the end, if you're still here, we'll talk about running because we like to jog and stuff. Yay! This is part uh, season one, episode V, which is Roman for five. And I don't know why they chose to use Roman numerals for all of the episodes since this is a pirate show. But hey, episode <laughs> V. Uh, so what happened in episode five of first season of, Peace, of Black Sails, Josh? So this is, uh, structurally, it's an interesting uh, episode because they've got Flint on his ship running down Bryson's ship uh, because Bryson has run off with the heavy guns that Flint needs to take on the Urca de Lima. And so sort of the frame of the episode is Flint and the crew of the Walrus uh, trying to catch Bryson. But while that's happening, we keep jumping back to uh, Nassau, where Eleanor, uh, her hold over the port has been uh, undermined by her father, and there's rioting pirates about to... Well, no, there are very angry pirates about to riot, um, and she's trying to hold things together. And meanwhile, Jack Rackham buys a brothel. <laughs> oh boy does he oh Jack Rackham that operator but there is a, a ton of stuff happening uh, and it's easy to kind of get distracted by the the action plot which is the, the chase scene and in, in the most awesome pirate action scene ever um, but there's also just a lot of stuff happening in and around that so that's that's this episode yes yes so now we talk about a cool scene that we liked in the in the episode rather than going shot for shot. I'm going to go with what you just alluded to. According to Josh, I don't know if I completely agree because there's another one we'll talk about when we get higher up in the episodes. But this is so far, by far, the best ship battle in, in Black Sails. Without a doubt. Is it the first one? <laughs> No, no. The, the the show starts with a, a ship to ship battle. Let's not. It's been forget. so long. Uh, <laughs> but right. yeah, this is this one is awesome. Uh, uh, quite possibly the best part is that they before the, as they're closing in on Bryson's ship, they turn to the accountant of Flint's crew and hand him a gun, and they say, "Yeah, everyone's up for this one. You've got to fight in this." And he's like, "No, I'm just the accountant." And they, you know, you you have to fight too. You're in it. And he, he serves as a very, very capable uh, point of view lens for the audience. Yes, yes. You know, I, I, I vacillate between thinking that the, the bits of Mr. Dufresne, the, the accountant, is just, hey, let's flesh out some of the chopper's crew because Captain Flint is our chopper in this. Uh, and this is his crew or his gang. Is it we're fleshing out that that character, make it more interesting as a, a mirror or lens into Captain Flint, how it operates, or is Mister Dufresne played by an erstwhile player who just like is out of town? He comes in every he or she comes in out of town every once in a while, and they're like, "Hey, can I play with you guys? Won't you play Mister Dufresne?" Could, thinking, well, we there you can do no wrong with the accountant, right? Yes, and with, all of a sudden, the good old accountant playbook. 
Exactly. I don't know what playbook that is. So I remember watching season one for the first time, and I spent a large portion of watching season one for the first time trying to figure out who were the PCs. And like the is is Billy the bosun a uh, PC? Is Mr. Gates the quartermaster a PC? Is the accountant a PC? And were I to make a hack for playing Black Sails specifically, uh, I might be tempted to make the quartermaster playbook, the bosun playbook, the accountant playbook, uh, just to just to do that and maybe refocus the the actual game on just Flint's crew. Um, but I, I think at the end of the day, Mr. Dufresne and Mr. Beauclerk and uh, who's the, the sale master expert uh, are, are all fleshing out uh, the, the gang. And it's, it's the, the GMing or the MC principles, right? You, you name everybody, you give everybody personality, you, you give them all simple but very easily to express motivations, go. And I think based on simple things like that, you get really cool characters like this. But mostly they're in an awesome pirate battle scene. So tell us about that. Oh, well, I, I didn't want to go too long in the tooth. We've already talked about the awesomeness of Mr. Dufresne freaking out. And there's a bit where Billy the Bosun tells him a little fib saying, well, this is your first attack and no one ever dies in the first attack. And that gives Mr. Dufresne just enough of a little bit of courage. He's got his little feather. He goes across yes. he gets blood, like someone's brains blown out into his mouth. He gets beat down and then he barely survives by going completely feral, completely feral <laughs> in flip mode to tearing a guy's throat out. It was amazing. Yeah. To, uh, to uh to branch out if if this were monster hearts he he went into his darkest self of the darkest accountant <laughs> yes oh man but uh and then the last bit i have to mention mr Bo beauclerk who was just referred to as mr beauclerk and then there's like a camera shot on new character who's part of the crew and uh there's this plan and they're trying to make the ship that they're attacking do a particular thing and then how are they going to do how are we going to convince the ship to do this stupid thing that no ship that's being attacked would want to do mr beauclerk the hell's that even mean mr and beauclerk then, is going to convince them <laughs> that's right he's going to convince them like what this is the heck is going on and then they get closer closer and he's he's sitting up on top and like the little like it's not a crow's nest it's just like a platform yeah and it turns out that he's an amazing sniper and he just shoots the guy who's the wheel the captain's wheel pop and the next guy pops up and he's like pop <laughs> No, you don't get to turn the wheel. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah, and you lost the wind. And then the captain on the other ship was like, prepare for borders. <laughs> Son of a bitch. <laughs> yeah, it's not like he's going to get a third cat to go up there. He's like, well, okay. Deep, deep, I'm hosting on my own petard. Cool. So what are some other cool scenes? Uh, Josh, you've got some awesome ones here. So what's, what's uh, so I've got. I've got two scenes that I really like that neither of which really have uh, PC moves in them, um, but they're, they're still really neat bits of character development. Um, the first is Anne goes to see Max in her, you know, captivity and uh, helps her with her kind of gruesome birth control procedure. Um, but there's also just some character interaction where Anne asks Max why she's letting them do this and that if she allows them to do anything, they'll walk all over her and yada, 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 because this is, this is the gun mugger talking to the Skinner. And uh, I kind of, I, I watched this scene. I think I watched it twice trying to figure out what exactly was happening uh, and what it really is, because this is episode five. And so far Anne has been, a really kind of mysterious character and a uh, very uh, car cards close to chest and not uh, explaining very much about herself. And this is actually, this is kind of the first time that she, she opens up. She's revealed things about her character through action before, but this is the first time that she's actually really spoken about how she believes the world works. Um, 
And uh, if we want to translate that into Apocalypse World Ease, I think uh, Anne's player uh, wants to develop the other player's uh, HX, their, their history stat for her. Like she wants at the end of this session for characters, probably very, very much Max and maybe also Rackham to say, the character that I know more about at the end of this session is Anne. Uh, because Anne, Anne initiates this scene and Anne is pretty much in control of what happens for this entire scene. And the whole point is just for her to talk to Max about how to deal with pirates. So, yeah. Yeah, the scene. Not not everything needs to be about dice rolling. Sometimes uh, there are subtler pressures and influences at work. And then like there's the, also, uh, yeah. Go ahead. Oh, I was going to say, I, I like that you point out that it doesn't necessarily have to be dice related, but but there were mechanics there by the history stat, which is really awesome. Yeah, uh, and then there's also just a. a amusing scene where silver the battle babe talks to eleanor the hall heart holder and uh explains how the skinner max has her fingers in eleanor's head even when she's not trying uh it's, it's a lovely line where he just says the moment that i make decisions based on her decisions i cede her a lot more power than i'm comfortable with which is totally like the battle babe the super cool nothing sticks on me like this is how you do it hard holder <laughs> you do not care you you slip away you do not let them determine your actions which is something that eleanor and many hard holders need to hear yeah yeah especially when the hard holder has the sex move of i give them stuff and the skinner's like they give me stuff <laughs> think about me a lot so yeah very very excellent uh, view on both of their and and i love that we had two scenes that you show where the gunlugger says, you know, this is how I see the world and this is how you see the world Skinner. And then we have this other scene, hard holder saying, okay, it's like this. And this, and, and the battle wave says, no, you need to see the world like this because it works like this. That's, that's awesome. Yes. All right. So PC moves. We didn't have a whole lot. I don't think not a whole lot of die rolling necessarily and i like the one where uh you talked about the top of the show rackham jack rackham who uh is currently the quartermaster of no ship and has a crew that has no ship and he's scrambling to try to figure out what to do in the previous episode um van or vane killed the uh brothel owner and uh so rackham decides he's gonna take over the brothel. So he comes up with some papers that look official and he walks in and talks to the madam and says, Hey, these papers and the, the, the your pimp, he basically said he's heading out and he signed this stuff over and we bought it lock, stock and barrel. And, uh, and it's like the madam is not going to go for it at all. And I said, I'm supposed to keep, this seems really fishy. Am I supposed to buy this and say nothing to no one? And Rackham says, yes. And then she says, I want to raise. And that's where we move to the point that I love in Apocalypse World where it says, you can try to manipulate someone or if you give them a barter, it's like hitting a manipula hitting a 10 plus max that you, you can kind of get other than advanced moves. 10 plus on the roll if you, if you bribe them. So she says, I want to raise. And he says, what are you making now? She said, 3% of gross. And he says, you can take 40. And she says, you got yourself a brothel. <laughs> <laughs> and then a smiling Jack Rackham looks back at Anne Bonnie, the gun lugger, and the threat that is uh, Vade. And they're both sitting in chairs and drinking. And he goes, we just got ourselves a brothel. <laughs> and they're like, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Yeah, they, are, they are not enamored with his plan. Cool. Uh, do you want to talk about Eleanor's trying to read yeah, so Eleanor's got her her knees cut out from under her by her father and so what she decides to do is basically replicate uh, the the Guthrie fence with a consortium of various captains who have uh, special inns or special uh, different ships and stuff uh, so basically she's trying to gobble this together out of I think five other uh, pirate captains and so she she's she's trying to manipulate her way all through this and the interesting thing is that 
like if you look at this die roll wise, first she talks to the 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 two worst performing pirates on the island. Like she's just like, guys, you are terrible pirates. You just you do not bring in money. You barely make more than your operating costs, but you have really big ships. Uh, and she tries to convince them that they can ferry goods to the colonies under uh, Captain Fraser's import license that he happens to have. And so she rolls through manipulate. She's got this. She's got the leverage, right? You you have a terrible record, and your people could make money without risking their lives. That's my leverage. I roll. And she gets she gets a weak hit, so she needs to like give them something right now that makes them believe that she can make this happen. And so the thing that they the the MC says is, okay, you've got to get a, a respectable pirate to back them because these guys are nothing. So you need to get somebody who's obviously a good pirate and knows his stuff. You gotta get him to back it. So she, Eleanor says, well, I just happen to have Hornigal right here. So I'll get him to do it. And Hornigal, this will totally work. Roll my dice. And she gets another weak hit. And Hornigal gives her like the hard choice. Says, I will, I will totally join up if you lift the ban on Bane. Which was a big, big thing and is really driving a lot of Eleanor's uh, situation that she overstepped or took a very big step of authority and took a ship away from a captain. And, and so she doesn't want to do this. And he gives her, he gives her a day to think about it because basically he's only in if Vane is cleared and then everybody else is only in if he's in. So uh, everything is, this is a nice little move snowball that eventually lends ends at a hard choice for Eleanor. So that's yeah. that's cute. That's awesome. Yes, I love that hard choice. That is that is definitely textbook TMCs on if you can tie the thing they won't do to be the, the hard choice for this other unrelated thing, if you can tie it in any way, no matter how tenuous, uh it's it's just juicy. It's super juicy. It's worth it. It payoff is great. Uh and um, then in, in the realm of MC hard moves, uh we will Continue. Wait, no. I'm no, getting ahead of myself. Boop, boop, boop. Ignore me. So the other PC move that I liked. Um, I'm pretty sure that one of Rackham, who's the operator, one of Rackham's gigs is an obligation gig to keep Vane happy. Because Vane is not a PC. Vane is a threat. And he's also Rackham's boss. So Rackham's got a job. It's like, keep Vane happy. Because... If Vane's not happy, he's going to go kill people and wreak havoc and sow chaos. So Rackham's got to like roll every day to make sure that Vane is happy. So when Vane's crew comes in and says, hey, Eleanor's lost all of her support, and you, we know that you hate Eleanor, let's go just destroy her completely. We see Rackham has made his moonlighting role this session, and Vane is happy and doesn't go with them. So Rackham has kind of inadvertently made things a little easier for Eleanor. I really love that. That's, that's so great. And then the segue that I almost just tried to do, uh, when we go into MC hard moves, Vane's crew still goes after Eleanor, just without Vane. And she has to roll Act Under Fire to kind of stand up to their intimidation. And she she does not make that role. And so the MC, instead of like throwing something obvious, trite, simple at her, just kind of holds on to that for a moment. And then two scenes later, Vane, who's been content, not out of Eleanor's actions, but he's been content and not acting against her, sees and hears all these things happening at Eleanor and decides, okay, yeah. I'm I'm throwing my hat in the ring. I'm going to see if I can topple Eleanor. So that's that's the hard move where sure your guards pushed back the leaderless crew, but you've got a bigger problem because Vane is coming for you now. Yeah. I I almost see that at the table as the player for Eleanor 
goes for the actor under fire. She biffs it. She rolls like a. I mean, it's it's, it's actor under fire, so it's cool. She's probably got a cool plus one. So maybe she rolls a one and two, maybe a snake eyes, but it's one of those where it's on the table and they have that moment of everybody going, ooh, and they all look at the MC. And the MC's like, I know what I'm gonna do, but I, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna double dip a little bit. So the leader of the Vane's crew says, Oh, really? Well, let's just, I'm gonna go back to the beach with your friend, Max, who we've got, you know trapped she's very resilient and then and you you're like oh oh but then then you reveal the real hard move which is a vein is now a threat like he is on the board and that that's awesome i love that one two punch yeah sometimes you know um, yeah maybe, how about you, Rich? what was your favorite hard move i i i mean i love a little bit of smack talk um, but the fact that Vane kind of stepped up was really awesome. I um, I don't know if this is necessarily a hard move, but one of the things that I saw was just a, a future announcing future badness. But the beginning opening scene for Eleanor, she says, you know, nobody has seen or heard from Mr. Scott all morning. And that didn't pay off until uh, later, later, later. It could easily have been a thing where the MC just says, well, Mr. Scott, you're number one, your guy, he's not around. Announcing future badness, and then Eleanor says something, and then the MC keeps that in their pocket until later, and they pull it out like this huge surprise, like "Oh man, where's Mister Scott? He's on the drama key, which is what Flint is trying to attack right now." I thought that was super cool. I love that. Yes. What about you? Any? And he's amongst the seventy plates of Chinese porcelain. Yeah, that was the weirdest bit. Oh man, there was a there was this scene where the captain of the Andromache says, "Go check on our seventy plates." And and his his first mate's like, "The hell are you talking about?" Like he gives him this look, like I don't even know what that means. <laughs> he says, "We have 70, 70 plates of Chinese porcelain to be delivered to Boston. Go check and make sure they are safely delivered. Perhaps throw some more straw on them." And the first mate's like, "I think I get it. That's really weird." <laughs> it was such an obtuse little bit to to get the surprise at the end that those those were all slaves and that Mr. Scott was thrown in among them. Rough. Yeah. You had a hard move you wanted to talk about as well. I, I, I'm not quite sure if it's exactly a hard move, but it's a good uh, MC general principle practice. Uh, so we've got Bryson, and he's he's running off with the guns. And these are guns that Eleanor has every right to demand. They're Guthrie guns on a Guthrie ship. And Bryson is taking off with them. Um, and it's important to remember that NPCs and the MC are not bound to recognize proper law and order. Um, sure, he's stealing them, but it's not like anybody has any recourse to law. So it's, it's an important part of there, there is no status quo in Apocalypse World. You cannot stand on your rights ever because there is... There is no foundation below you. There is no civilization. You are making it as you go. Uh, so that's, uh, uh, for me especially, when I run Apocalypse World, I tend to forget this part. I tend to create the culture and civilization that they are all participating in, and I tend to forget that it is, if, if it's there at all, it is paper thin and anybody with any amount of motivation, we'll just tear right through it and go rampaging. Uh, so it's it's a it's a good thing to remember. Like no people just you know take stuff that is other people's and run off with it. And you cannot rely on anything to happen the way you want it to happen unless you've got roles and a gang to back you up. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> I was taught a little lesson by a player in a Apocalypse World game. Um, that I was in seeing where I, I kind of default sometimes that I, I have to be careful not to default to like the D and D brain. So they go into a bar, start a fight, gun somebody down. And then my thing is, Oh, well there's a gate at this place. Then there are guards. So the guards will come and the player looks at me and he's like, Really, there are guards who come and give a crap about this little piss ant bar? Like, oh my God, you're right. There's no status quo. Those gate guys are there just so big raiders don't come in and 
tear up their stuff. Their stuff's not at the bar. And that was a really useful kind of lesson from one of the players that got it a little bit better than I did. So, <laughs> yeah, the status quo thing's tough to maintain because we got kind of our, our – we've trained ourselves to say, well, there's always an organization so that I as the MC, you know, as the GM will have something to respond to X threat, but sometimes it just lies there. Yeah. It is not your job to keep, to keep the PCs civilized or to present the NPCs as civilized, right? If, if anything, it's the PCs job to cobble together civilization. Yeah. Yeah. I just, um, real, real quick, but just to talk about that, I just, um, kind of hard moved on my, the gun lugger in a game that I'm currently running where he, I needed to get into a place. And so I did a little bit of mountain wish trick where I kind of said, so you just saw this guy get knifed and the three guys ran away. What did you do to the three guys? Like, did you gun them down or let them go? Cause it was in a bit of a crowd. And he says, well, I marked them. I know who they are. I'll come after them later. Cause it's a hold. I know these people, you know, it's not like there's thousands of them. And so I, there's this guy bleeding on the street who just got knifed, and the other people are just walking right by. What do you do? He's like, dang it. He's the civilization. So he picked <laughs> him up and took him to the angel. So it was pretty great. Cheap, nice. cheap move. Cheap move, but it was fun. Yeah. Oh, man. That's, that's you know, that's the, the every other move in a superhero game. It's like, <laughs> well, you could win, or you could take care of people. You're going to save the bus full of people or your girlfriend. Do, do, do. Sorry. <laughs> I love that one. Awesome. Anything else about uh, episode five of Black I don't Saints? think so. This is a really nice episode. It's a bit of a slow burner because it starts off and you're like, oh, is anything happening? And then you realize that, oh, no, everything is, is accreting and building up. And uh, it goes to a very happy place at the end. And by happy, I do not actually mean happy. Yeah, yeah. It goes to the place where a person blows up in front of Captain Flint, and then you just see the blood on his face, and him with this like, "I'm so pissed off right now." Yeah, and he's he's so pissed off at other things that the gore and viscera spattering against him is like just an annoyance. Like, oh, geez, oh, blood. We don't have it in our notes, but I do want to at least set up for episode six that the episode we just talked about where it ends. So Captain Flint has taken the Andromache, key, but most of the crew or enough of the crew of the Andromache key have gone below decks and they are fortified and they've cut the rudder and there is a shit they can do about it. And, and the captain just sent that guy who blew up in front of Captain Flint to say, Oh, by the way, I sent note out to this other huge ass ship that's coming your way that there were pirates. So, you're totally screwed. And so he knows I've got to get these guns now, or I'm never going to get the Urca de Lima. The and Scarborough, do it fast. The Scarborough is coming and we're sitting on a uh, hold full of slaves. So you can't just burn the ship to the water line. Yep. yep. There you go. There's, yep. I don't even know how many hard decisions that is layered on top of each other, but it is, it's, it's a masterwork. Yes, absolutely. Let's switch over to running. Uh, so jo Josh, how are, you, how are you doing when you're running right now? Where are you I, at? I actually, I'm just getting back from General Assembly in Portland for uh, my church's annual General Assembly. Uh, so I haven't been running. I, in fact, was up at 3 a.m. today to get on the plane, well, to get on the tag in the taxi to get in the plane to get in the flyaway bus to drive home. So that was nine hours of travel. Uh, awesome. All of that to say, I was in Portland and uh, busy, so I, I actually haven't run in like a week, which is not good, uh, but I am quite possibly going to end this and go running. Cool. Well, then we will quickly end it uh, after I give my update, which is good no, news. Every, every every bit that we postpone means it gets cooler outside, so it's all right. <laughs> I'll slow down. <laughs> um, I... Hey. I Rained twice this past week. It rained a lot, and also I've got a, um, a family member who's in the hospital, so we spent some time there this weekend. But I was able to run a couple times, and the super best part was that Wednesday morning, my 5 a.m. at 5 uh, running buddy, what he's been on the mend for a couple months now, 
Um, he's had a couple of, of issues, body issues, and he said, hey, man, we got to get back on track. And so we hit it and we went and ran. We did three miles slow, but it was just, you know, there's running by yourself and the games that you play to keep yourself occupied. And then there's running with somebody that you can actually have a conversation with. And it's just really amazing. And I was so thankful that uh, I was able to run with my buddy. So that was super awesome. Cool. cool. All right. Well, I'm sorry, but you're going to have to go running now. It looks like Josh. Excellent. <laughs> So have a good have a good uh, good run. Don't kill yourself. Nine hours of travels a workout in and of itself, man. Yeah, yeah, I know. I, I expect it will be run, shower, collapse. <laughs> Can you go to sleep right after running? I always have the most trouble if I if I run enough, I'll get my heart rate to a point where I'm like wired. Oh no, no. I after a run and after a shower after the run, I am ready for a nap or sleep every single time. That is awesome. Oh, yeah. That's great. Cool. I will not have any trouble going to sleep. <laughs> Killer. Well, thanks again, Josh, and thanks, everybody, uh, for watching. You should totally be watching Black Sails with us. The second season has been amazing so far. Josh is ahead of me. I am slowly, like, taking my time. Oh, my God. It's so awesome. I know. We will totally gab when I get there off air, and then we'll do it again when we get up to that episode. So cool. Thanks, everybody, for watching, and uh, have a great night. Good night.